Hello. Welcome to New Frontiers in Terahertz Technology with Mona Jarahi. I'm Mike Hamilton, your host for this IEEE Microwave Theory and Technique Society webcast, which is sponsored by National Instruments. Before we start, I'll mention a few housekeeping items. First, this presentation will be archived. A recording should be posted approximately 24 hours after we finish the presentation. We'll send all registrants an email when the archived webinar goes up so that you can revisit it or share it with your colleagues. Second, we encourage questions. We'll answer them after the talk, but you can submit them at any time during the discussion. Enter your question in the Q&A box on the left side of the window of the webcast window, and don't forget to click Submit. Third, some words about the interface. You can enlarge the slide area uh, by manipulating the window size, and you can also go into full screen mode if you desire. Refresh or reload the current page if you encounter problems. If you're listening over your computer speakers, you can adjust the media player volume uh, if you need more sound. Remember, you may also adjust your system's master volume. The icons at the bottom of the webinar window include a resource list. Clicking that link will start the process to download copies of the slides that will be presented today. Now let's introduce our speaker. Mona Jarahi received her BS degree in electrical engineering from Sharif University of Technology in 2000 and her MS and PhD degrees in electrical engineering from Stanford University in 2003 and 2007. She served as a postdoctoral scholar at the University of California, Berkeley from 2007 to 2008. After serving as an assistant professor at the University of Michigan, she joined UCLA in 2013 as an associate professor of electrical engineering and the director of the Terahertz Electronics Laboratory. Professor Drahi has made significant contributions to the development of ultra-fast electronic and optoelectronic devices in integrated systems for terahertz and millimeter wave sensing, imaging, computing, and communication systems through the use of novel materials, nanostructures, and quantum well structures, as well as innovative plasmonic and optical concepts. The outcomes of her research have, have appeared in over 150 publications and 120 keynote and invited talks and her work has received a significant amount of attention from a large number of scientific news outlets. Her scientific achievements have been recognized by several international and national prestigious awards, including the PCASE, recognition from, recognition from the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation, Outstanding Young Engineer Award from the IEEE Microwave Theory and Technique Society, and countless numbers of other awards, including uh, most of the early career awards. Uh, and, and this is among a list that is just too long to read here. Professor Drahi is actively involved in multiple professional societies. She's a senior member of IEEE and a distinguished lecturer of IEEE MTTS, among a host of other honors. So now it's my pleasure to turn the virtual podium over to Professor Mona Drahi for New Frontiers in Terahertz Technology. Mona? Uh, thanks, Michael, for your introduction. It is my pleasure to give this webinar today. Uh, which is uh, mainly focused on a new generation of uh, terahertz devices uh, that utilize plasmonic and artificially enge engineered structures uh, to enable unprecedented functionalities at terahertz frequencies. Uh, but in the beginning, I would like to start uh, with some introduction about uh, terahertz waves and their applications and basically the motivation for our research. Uh, as you know, terahertz uh, frequency range is uh, somewhere between optical and radio wave frequency ranges. Uh, a lot of optically opaque materials uh, ha are transparent to terahertz waves. Uh, so terahertz waves uh, allow us to see inside uh, visually unaccessible environments. A lot of molecules have very unique spectral signatures at terahertz frequencies, and that allows us to remotely identify uh, chemical composition of uh, different media. And also, these are very low energy radiation compared to X-ray and even optical waves. Uh, so the combination of these specifications uh, open up uh, a lot of potential applications for terahertz waves, and basically, uh, that uh, combination uh, is uh, the motivation for our research. Uh, the range of applications uh, are, potential applications are very broad. 
ranging from medical imaging uh, to uh, uh, industrial quality control, uh, space uh, explorations, atmospheric studies, uh, and uh, different kinds of sensing. Uh, so, in the medical domain, uh, terahertz uh, waves are very promising tools uh, to identify between different kinds of tissues, uh, either the cancerous and uh, non-cancerous tissues, or uh, they have information uh, about uh, different kinds of biomarkers. Uh, so because of that, one can get very high contrast in the terahertz image, sometimes much better than what optical waves offer. Uh, however, operating at terahertz frequencies, uh, we deal with a trade-off um, in the resolution of the image we get. Also, because uh, of uh, having a lot of water in biological uh, and human tissue, uh, the penetration depths of terahertz waves in the tissue are limited. Uh, however, I have to mention, uh, because uh, of uh, the wavelength range we are dealing with, still uh, wave penetration depths in the tissue are more than optical regime. So you can potentially see deeper um, cancerous uh, or other types of uh, abnormalities in human tissue. In biological domain, a lot of interesting potentials have been uh, introduced. For example, uh, for uh, genome sequencing, terahertz waves have shown a lot of great promise. Um, and uh, for understanding dynamics uh, of a lot of uh, cellular functions. Uh, security screening has been uh, one uh, domain that, uh, in fact, in early days brought a lot of funding to this field, uh, basically uh, seeing inside uh, packages, seeing through clothing, or identifying uh, different kinds of hazardous materials and explosives are motivation there. Uh, Non-destructive quality control is another uh, application which uh, arguably has been the most successful application on the uh, commercial side, uh, basically uh, uh, both in uh, pharmaceutical uh, industry and also uh, in food industry or aerospace, one can characterize uh, different layers of coating that are used, their homogeneity uh, and uh, uh, their thickness, and the geometry basically uh, can be characterized through terahertz waves. And last but not the least is the application uh, in uh, atmospheric uh, domain and space domain. Uh, this has been uh, basically the a first uh, application of terahertz waves. And uh, in fact, uh, this is a domain that uh, really uh, resulted in a lot of advancement uh, in the field uh, because uh, terahertz waves uh, allow you to uh, understand the uh, constituents of cosmic background radiation uh, and uh, other uh, types of chemicals um, in new planets or in Earth's atmosphere. Uh, so uh, these are just uh, some examples of uh, potential applications of terahertz waves. Uh, however, uh, a lot of these applications are uh, basically uh, shown um, through uh, very bulky uh, terahertz instruments, uh, very expensive terahertz instruments, uh, which are not uh, really ready to get to the consumer market uh, and uh, give us massive application that uh, general public can use for imaging and sensing. Uh, and um, in the next part of the talk, I will discuss what are some of these challenges and how uh, different groups have been able to advance the field uh, by uh, introducing uh, new techniques that can expand uh, the uh, practicality and efficiency of these terahertz devices. So first I would like to uh, start with terahertz sources uh, that uh, are uh, maybe the most important component in any of the uh, imaging or sensing systems one can imagine in terahertz frequencies. 
So being in uh, the spectrum somewhere between optical and radio wave regime, uh, there are two possible ways that one can make a terahertz source. Either one can scale uh, the, um, a transistor-based and electronic-based source to uh, extend its frequency to terahertz regime, or one can use an optical uh, technique like lasers. So if you use an electronic technique, uh, even though you use very uh, high cutoff frequency transistor, uh, but at uh, anyway, uh, you will have a cutoff frequency in terahertz frequency range, uh, and you have parasitics that uh, extremely reduce the gain of your uh, amplifiers and your oscillators. So the output power of terahertz sources that are built through uh, fully electronic techniques have been limited, although there has been a lot of progress. Uh, and uh, the operation frequency of electronic sources uh, have reached uh, to one terahertz range, but it is uh, very unlikely that these kinds of sources can cover the whole spectrum and go all the way to several uh, terahertz. Uh, the other uh, possible uh, approach is using an optical approach, like using a laser diode or using a quantum cascade laser. Um, if one wants to use these techniques, the band gap uh, energy of the semiconductor uh, that they need to use uh, would become very comparable to the thermal noise and phonon resonances in the lattice of the semiconductor. And as a result, these kinds of lasers have serious trouble uh, to uh, give acceptable performance at room temperatures. As a result, uh, although we have very powerful quantum cascade lasers, for example, nowadays operating at terahertz frequencies, operating at room temperature remains a major challenge uh, for these techniques. And I don't want to get into uh, uh, same details, but uh, it can be easily shown that if one wants to have a terahertz detector, will exactly face the same physical problems I mentioned. Either they would like to take an electronic approach, in that case they will be limited uh, by the parasitics uh, and uh, the cutoff frequency of transistors, or if they want to use a fully optical approach like pho uh, general photo detectors that we use, they will be limited uh, by um, thermal noise, uh, which limits the operation at room temperature. So while uh, both approaches that I described here, electronic approach and optical uh, approach, have um, a lot of uh, merits and uh, have already shown a lot of potentials in different uh, frequency ranges uh, in the terahertz regime, uh, the approach that we take in my group is uh, sort of combining optical and electrical uh, capabilities uh, using advantages of both sides. Um, so before uh, discussing uh, the approach that we use, uh, I would like to just c show you a quick survey of uh, the radiation power of different kinds of terahertz sources that are available, uh, summarizing what uh, I uh, already described uh, on the left-hand side. Uh, we have electronic sources like impact diodes, gun diodes, and frequency multipliers, as you can see. The radiate output power uh, basically dramatically drops as they reach the terahertz frequency regime. Uh, on the optical side, the same different lasers um, reduce their radiation power as they reach uh, lower frequencies. And within the terahertz regime, we only have terahertz quantum cascade lasers, uh, which I mentioned have a, a limitation for their operation temperature. Uh, which, again, I have to emphasize is fine for a lot of applications, uh, like space applications. However, uh, for having a compact and portable and durable device, one has to think about operation temperature of these devices. So going uh, again uh, to the approach that I wanted to talk about um, is uh, basically combining the capabilities from optical and electronic side. 
uh, that can be uh, basically done through nonlinear optical processes or through photoconduction. And although we work on both techniques in my group, today I want to talk about photoconductive terahertz devices because I believe they have a lot of potentials that have been not really tapped yet. Uh, so uh, the approach that we have is that, uh, okay, if we don't have uh, very good fundamental sources like an electrical oscillator or an optical laser uh, in the terahertz frequency range, uh, however, we have excellent optical sources that are available right now. They're very, uh, they can offer very high powers, very good spectral performances if one wants to have broadband or narrowband uh, terahertz uh, operation. And also, uh, they, are very, they can be very compact and portable. So why not um, finding a way to efficiently convert light energy to terahertz energy and basically uh, solve the problem this way? And photoconduction is a way to do that. Uh, this is not what my group came up with. This is um, an approach that has been out there for more than 30 years. But I will explain how we were able to enhance their efficiencies uh, by several orders of magnitude. So the way these devices work uh, is that uh, you make an ultra-fast photo detector or photoconductor. Uh, you connect it to a terahertz antenna and you pump it with an input optical beam where you can embed terahertz frequency information. So how is that done? Uh, for, uh, for example, if one wants to generate a broadband terahertz pulse, they pump their device with a very short femtosecond optical pulse, uh, and basically the photo detector follows the envelope of that pulse and uh, generates uh, a current that is fed to antenna that has all those broadband terahertz information. Or if one is interested in generating CW terahertz radiation, uh, they can uh, combine two CW optical beams uh, with a terahertz frequency difference. And as a result, the envelope of the uh, optical beam will vary as a function of the terahertz frequency that we set. So now, if our photo detector is ultra fast, it can follow that envelope efficiently, and the current that it induces and feeds to the antenna will have the terahertz frequency components that we need. So there are several advantages for this technique. First of all, as you can see, Almost half of the burden is already on the optical source, which uh, thanks to a lot of advancements in the field, uh, we have excellent optical sources. Basically, you can create any kind of terahertz waveform you want with appropriate uh, optical sources that are already existing. Uh, the second uh, important specification that I'm personally very excited about is that conversion from light to terahertz is a, a very linear process. Uh, we are not limited by manly row limit. Basically, if for any photon that uh, is incident on our device, we generate an electron hole and route it to our terahertz antenna, we can uh, generate radiation with more, uh, up to 100% optical to terahertz conversion efficiency. Uh, for example, uh, terahertz sources based on nonlinear optical phenomena uh, don't have that advantage. So because of uh, this huge potential, we are very excited about these devices and have worked on them uh, extensively. However, um, what we observed when we started working on these devices was that although theoretically we expect uh, up to 100% optical to terahertz conversion efficiencies from these devices, efficiency of the devices that were available at that time were way lower than uh, what we expected. And the reason can be seen uh, on the right-hand side of my slide where I'm zooming in on the active area of the device where optical beam is incident. If you look at that part, you see that electron holes uh, shown by red and um, blue spheres are generated when optical beam is incident on the device. 
and uh, they are drifted by the bioelectric field uh, that is applied through the terahertz antenna. In order to have 100% optical to terahertz conversion efficiency, these electrons and holes have to reach the terahertz antenna within a sub-picosecond time scale. However, because the speed of carriers in the semiconductor is limited by scattering in the semiconductor, uh, in order to have that kind of ultra-fast response, the transport path length of carriers should be in the order of few tens of nanometer. However, if we uh, want to focus light within such a small dimension, we are limited by a diffraction limit, and as a result, we cannot really get 200% optical to terahertz conversion efficiency because we cannot focus light that uh, close to the antennas with such small uh, beam spot sizes. To address that problem, uh, we introduce uh, use of plasmonic nanostructures to make this light matter interaction more efficient at nanoscale. Basically, the entire concept that we are suggesting here is the same, using a ultra-fast photodetector or photoconductor connected to an antenna and pump it with an optical beam with terahertz frequency information. However, what we do different here is that at the input part of the antenna where optical beam is incident, we create plasmonic nanostructures which have feature sizes uh, that are deep sub-wavelength in nanometer range, and we engineer them such that at the optical wavelength that we are interested, uh, we can funnel light through the small apertures we form by these plasmonic nanostructures uh, efficiently, and we confine most of the light within a nanometer distance from the antenna. Uh, so with that, uh, although the speed of the carriers in the substrate are not different, but at least we have brought more carriers close to the antenna, and that can improve the efficiency of radiation while operating at ultra-fast speeds. So uh, here I showed a grating as the plasmonic nanostructure, but uh, the concept is not limited by grating. Any kind of periodic metallic nanostructures embedded at the input port of the antenna can do the job. However, plasmonic structures that are in form of gratings are specifically attractive for us uh, because by changing the aspect ratio of these structures, we can um, have a control over the efficiency of light and matter interaction. So here I'm showing that for a given plasmonic uh, grating, depending on the relation between the incident wave wavelengths as, uh, and uh, the geometry of the uh, grating, one can excite different um, guided modes in the plasmonic gratings. Uh, in the upper left corner, I'm showing a grating which has a height much smaller than the incident wavelength. So in this case, we are exciting the zeroth order guided mode of the waveguides that we form by the gratings. And as we go to wavelengths that uh, are smaller and become comparable with the height of the gratings, then we start exciting the resonance mode of these sub-wavelength sub waveguides we form by the gratings, which means in this domain we can have uh, much more efficient interaction between light and semiconductor at nanoscale. So today I show that by using the zeroth order resonance mode, which is the top left corner uh, uh, mode that I'm showing in this slide, uh, we are able to increase optical to terahertz conversion efficiency by more than two orders of magnitude. And I'll show also, as we go to higher aspect ratio plasmonic gratings, we can increase that uh, optical to terahertz conversion efficiency by another order of magnitude. And now we are reaching to optical to terahertz conversion efficiencies close to 10%. And we believe there is more room to improve that. So uh, these structures allow us to really reach uh, to the promised high efficiency potential of these kinds of terahertz sources. Uh, so, as the first proof of concept uh, for this idea, 
uh, as I mentioned, we started with a grating, and uh, as a first proof of concept, we picked an arbitrary antenna, um, in this case, a bow tie antenna, uh, to see the impact of plasmonic nanostructures. Uh, well, in this study, we were not targeting any specific uh, frequency range uh, or uh, bandwidth. We uh, just uh, wanted to see how embedding plasmonic nanostructures versus not using any plasmonic nanostructure can affect the efficiency of the device. So before showing the experimental results, here on the top right uh, uh, figure where I'm showing the a finite element analysis of optical absorption near the antenna port of a non-plasmonic design, you'd see that while uh, a major portion of the optical wave is shadowed uh, by the antenna, the rest of the optical wave is really spread in the semiconductor uh, with several micrometer distances away from the antenna, while in the uh, bottom right um, figure, uh, I'm showing how light can be significantly enhanced in intensity near the plasmonic structures. Um, and in this case, we have much more carriers that can be swept to the antenna in a sub-picosecond time scale. So we fabricated uh, these two proof-of-concept plasmonic and non-plasmonic devices. Uh, as you can see here in this picture, and tested them exactly under the same condition. As you can see in the graph here, the plasmonic structure showed 50 times higher optical to terrorist conversion efficiencies compared to the non-plasmonic design. And if you trace it back to the current that was fed to these two devices, you see about seven times enhancement in the current. So this basically proves uh, the expectation that we had. It proves that if we have a, a higher radiation uh, in a plasmonic design, it is because uh, we increase the ultra-fast current fed to the antenna. And because the radiation power from a terahertz antenna, any antenna, has a quadratic relation with the current you feed to it, uh, the impact uh, would be quadratic on the overall radiation power. So if by using plasmonic structures, we have enhanced the current fed to the antenna by seven uh, times here, their radiation power enhanced by uh, 50 times. So this was a start. Um, and uh, one other thing that uh, we uh, were eager to try was to use these devices in the detection mode as well. A good uh, feature of these kinds of photoconductive devices is that you can reverse operate the same device uh, to use it as a detector. When you use it as a source, you bias the device using a power supply and you pump it with an optical beam and you get the radiation out. If you want to use it as a detector, you don't bias the device. You let the received terahertz radiation induce a voltage at the input port of the antenna and if the, uh, you have an optical beam incident at the same time on the antenna, then the photocurrent you generate in the device uh, will show how strong your terahertz radiation was. So if by using plasmonic structures, we are able to confine more electron holes next to the antenna to generate higher terahertz powers, this can definitely help detection sensitivity too, because now if we can find more carriers next to the antenna with an incident terahertz field, we are able to sweep a larger number of carriers and get better responsivities. And uh, for the same device that I showed that we use as a source, here I show how its performance is as a detector. Uh, we used um, a commercially available terahertz source that we had in our lab and uh, we tested uh, its output power both with our plasmonic and non-plasmonic uh, terahertz devices we built. As you can see, we saw uh, more than 30 times enhancement uh, in the detected signal, which uh, operated uh, with a similar enhancement over uh, 1.5 terahertz bandwidth. And we confirmed uh, that uh, the noise of uh, both plasmonic and non-plasmonic uh, designs are exactly the same. 
uh, and uh, that's expected because noise of these devices are uh, limited by Nyquist noise, which is not really related to uh, plasmonic structures. It is just related to resistance of the device, which doesn't matter if you use uh, plasmonic structures or not. So if the responsivity is 30 times enhanced uh, for using plasmonic structures and uh, also noise is the same, it means that we have increased the sensitivity of our terahertz detector by a factor of 30. So now if one wants to make an imaging or spectroscopy system and uses plasmonic terahertz source and detector, only the one I showed here can easily get uh, 1,500 times enhancement in uh, the efficiency of the uh, detected signal. So we got very excited about these potentials after this first proof of concept, and then we were able to improve this performance even further. Here I show a very powerful terahertz source uh, that we uh, built uh, using this concept. Basically, uh, we are interested in uh, generating very high power broadband terahertz radiation, uh, which is uh, a very important component uh, in an imaging uh, or spectroscopy system. So in this case, we uh, use uh, plasmonic uh, dipole antennas, uh, and uh, we pump them with an optical beam. Uh, because the radiation in far field from these structures add uh, constructively, uh, by combining the radiation from all these components, we can get very high terahertz radiation powers. Here you see the radiation power of this device exceeds uh, several milliwatts, and the bandwidth exceeds uh, 5 terahertz and further. So this is not the only limit that uh, these devices can operate. Uh, we can use even higher aspect ratio plasmonic structures to improve this efficiency even further. As I mentioned, by using a grating, one uh, can enhance uh, the interaction between light and semiconductor. Uh, and if you use a 3D uh, grating, you can enhance that interaction even further. So here I'm showing a schematic of our next generation de design where we switched our plasmonic gratings from a 2D plasmonic grating to a 3D plasmonic grating. And in this specific work, we switched our antenna to a spiral, log spiral antenna to just have more bandwidth and tunability. So we built two um, designs to compare, one plasmonic with 2D plasmonic structures. Uh, I'm showing in the top part of this figure and one with 3D plasmonic structures that I'm showing in the bottom of this picture. And from the finite element analysis, you see that obviously the 3D plasmonic structure gives you a much more efficient light matter interaction at nanoscale, so we will expect much stronger terahertz radiation out of this source. So we fabricated both of these devices and tested them exactly under the same condition. Uh, so uh, before showing the experimental results, uh, I want to sh tell you uh, that uh, the only challenge with these 3D plasmonic structures is that as you go uh, to higher aspect ratio structures, because the optical transmission mode through plasmonic structures become more resonant, then your bandwidth is narrow and uh, also your operation is very sensitive uh, to the tolerances you have in fabrication. For example, for a plasmonic grating, which is 3D, if you slightly change the height of your grating, you can shift this resonance mode. So depending on what laser you have and what kind of tolerances you have on the optical side, uh, this is uh, the challenge to be careful uh, to get exactly uh, the right uh, geometry to get the best performance at the wavelength of interest. Uh, so here uh, I'm showing uh, the experimental results of the radiation power uh, from a plasmonic terahertz source with 3D plasmonic structures in comparison with almost identical design which uses 2D plasmonic structures. The blue curve uh, here shows the radiated power uh, at uh, 1.5 uh, milliwatt optical power from the 3D design 
And the red curve shows the radiation power at 1.5 milliwatt optical power for the 2D plasmonic design. This is the design that already gave us two orders of magnitude enhancement compared to the state of the art. And here you see we extended its efficiency by another order of magnitude. And we're very excited that with this design, at a 1.5 milliwatt optical power, we are generating 105 microwatt uh, terahertz power, which is 7.5% optical to terahertz conversion efficiency. Knowing that with the lens that we use for this design, we are already losing 30% of our radiation, it means that we are getting really close to the fundamental physical limit for efficiency of these designs. So the better one can confine uh, light at the nanoscale and uh, couple the generated carriers to the antenna, the more efficient terahertz radiation can be achieved. So uh, one thing I want to mention is that the experimental results I showed so far were uh, mostly for pulse terahertz generation. Uh, the concept, as I mentioned, can easily work for CW terahertz generation. So here you see that uh, the plasmonic spiral antenna that I introduced was tested under CW operation. So the device is not changed here. The only thing we do different is that we switch our optical source to two heterodyning optical beams. Uh, so you can see from the bottom graph that uh, we can uh, have a broadly tunable terahertz radiation by slight tuning in the wavelength of the optical beam, and the radiation powers are reaching milliwatt or exceeding milliwatt at terahertz uh, uh, frequency range. So there is a great promise for these devices, uh, even for CW operation. And one other good feature of these devices is that you can put them in arrays and pump them with multiple beams coming from the same source or different sources, and that allows us to extend uh, the power levels to much higher powers. Here you see, for example, by using an array of three by three of the same devices, uh, we were able to boost the power uh, to two uh, milliwatt at terahertz frequencies. And another great flexibility uh, we are seeing here is that because we are having an array of devices and the phase of the radiated terahertz beam is directly related to the phase of the optical incident beam, uh, we can manipulate the phase front of the terahertz radiation by manipulating the phase front of the optical beam. So we have excellent spatial light modulators or even integrated uh, optical uh, phase modulators that we can use uh, to manipulate the phase of the optical beam incident on each individual antenna here. And with that, we can change the phase front of the terahertz radiation, do a lot of interesting beam steering, and uh, also beam shaping. So this is one thing we did on the optical side, but I just want to mention that one can also embed uh, reconfigurable metamaterials uh, inside these devices to even uh, manipulate the beam shape and beam direction uh, in a passive way. For example, here I'm showing a reconfigurable metamaterial we recently built uh, using uh, vanadium dioxide as a phase change material. Uh, and uh, by controlling the current passing through each element of this metasurface, we can manipulate the phase of the terahertz beam passing through it. So by that, we can uh, change the direction of the terahertz beam uh, radiating out of this device. So here I show the surface that we designed, and here you can see that by changing the current distribution on the metasurface elements, uh, we were able to uh, steer the terahertz radiation by 45 degrees uh, in 1D, and one can do uh, this beam steering in 2D too, as you can see here. And the advantage of uh, this kind of metasurface is that uh, you can uh, easily place it at the output facet of any terahertz radiation source uh, to basically do beam steering independent of terahertz radiation source. Uh, so uh, our um, device is the one on the left-hand side where we add these um, reconfigurable metamaterials to the facet uh, of our photoconductive 
uh, plasmonic photoconductive terahertz source. Uh, however, uh, one can add it to other types of terahertz sources like Vixel-based or quantum cascade-based uh, type of lasers. So going back to our terahertz source, uh, I want to mention another important direction that we work on, and it's very important when we want to uh, eventually bring these devices to the consumer market, and that is miniaturizing the uh, size of uh, the whole device and uh, full integration of the system. So the devices I showed so far uh, that uh, gave us very high terahertz uh, powers uh, and very good terahertz detection sensitivities uh, are very compact. However, we use bulky lasers to pump those devices. Uh, there is no reason we have to use bulky lasers for uh, these kinds of terahertz optoelectronics. One can use integrated uh, compact uh, optical sources on the same chip uh, to um, solve this problem and have a single chip and compact solution. So to achieve this goal, we are uh, collaborating with uh, different laser groups all over the world. Um, here I'm showing the example of two of those collaborations. So uh, here uh, I'm showing um, a collaboration, um, the results of a collaboration with uh, City Dublin University, where they built us, uh, built for us um, two DFB lasers, where we have a control over uh, the radiation wavelength of each of these lasers, and simultaneously uh, we can, uh, using the control current to this laser, we can generate two optical tones uh, with a frequency difference that can be tuned, and it covers a terahertz frequency uh, from all the way 0.1 terahertz to 3 terahertz with excellent line width and stability. So then we packaged uh, this very compact optical source with our terahertz photo mixers, and as you can see, we are able to get the same great performance in terms of a fraction of milliwatt um, terahertz power over a frequency range all the way from uh, 0.1 uh, to 3 terahertz, but this time through a very compact and portable platform. Uh, also, here I'm showing uh, the result of another collaboration uh, that we have done with Professor Chi Wei Wang's group at UCLA. This time, the optical source we are using to pump our devices uh, is a frequency comb, uh, which is uh, built on a CMOS technology. And uh, here, the external uh, uh, um, output power of this uh, laser uh, will be very uh, stable. Uh, in fact, uh, by having exciting, by exciting these frequency combs, even though we have temperature variations in the environment, which results in fluctuations uh, in the radiation wavelength, but the spacing uh, between the comb lines will be very stable. So with this uh, structure, we can get terahertz radiation uh, with uh, frequency stability of hertz level. So again, we have packaged uh, these sources with um, optical sources with our plasmonic photo mixers, uh, and uh, we can have a very compact device that uh, offers us very high terahertz powers. Here you see uh, a fraction of a milliwatt in the uh, 1.4, 1.3 uh, uh, type of terahertz frequency range. Uh, and uh, again, I want to remind this is through a very compact flat platform and the stability of uh, this source is uh, in the order of hertz. So not only we can use uh, plasmonic terahertz sources and detectors to uh, get very high terahertz powers and high terahertz detection sensitivities, uh, but also we can have uh, um, these kinds of performances through very compact, portable, and uh, eventually in the future, if we produce them in large volumes, low-cost platform. Uh, so since I'm running out of time, uh, I would like to uh, conclude um, uh, uh, my uh, talk uh, by um, saying that um, 
plasmonic nanostructures and other artificially engineered structures like reconfigurable metamaterials uh, embedded inside photoconductive terahertz sources and detectors uh, have a lot of promise to offer very high terahertz radiation powers, very low uh, sensitivities, uh, very high sensitivities, um, uh, low noise uh, det terahertz detection performances, and uh, that can enable uh, a lot of high performance imaging and sensing systems. Um, I didn't have time during this webinar to go into more examples on the application side that my group is involved. Please check uh, our group website. We are uh, using these kinds of powerful sources and detectors uh, for various medical imaging, non-destructive evaluation, uh, plant studies, uh, agricultural studies, uh, pharmaceutical industries, uh, and also we are building heterodyne, plasmonic heterodyne terahertz receivers for space applications. Uh, also, uh, we are using these high sensitivity uh, spectroscopy systems that we build uh, through plasmonic uh, terahertz sources and detectors uh, for biosensing at nanoscale. Uh, so finally, I would like to uh, acknowledge uh, my group, um, uh, my former and present uh, students in terahertz electronics lab, my collaborators uh, and sponsors, and I would like to thank IEEE MTT again for their invitation uh, today and would be happy to answer your question. Great, thank you very much, Mona. Uh, excellent presentation and uh, covered a lot of really interesting work. Uh, so now it's time for our question and answer session. We have a few minutes for questions. And, and, uh, uh, but before we start that, please remember that you can still submit questions through the Q&A panel uh, and be sure to click Submit on that. Okay, so here is our first question. Uh, and this is kind of a, just a general question, but any potential applications in the automotive industry? Are there any products associated with that that you see on the horizon? Um, yes, that's a very good question. Uh, in fact, um, in uh, the recent uh, TARS conferences uh, that I visit exhibits, uh, I was told that currently one of the most uh, successful commercial applications is in auto industry. Uh, and in fact, it is for non-destructive evaluation in the production line. Uh, basically, in order to characterize uh, the specifications of the paint and coatings used in the cars, uh, terahertz is a unique technology that uh, can provide information that not other, no other technology can offer. Uh, the wavelengths and pulse widths are excellent uh, for measuring uh, coatings and thickness levels, uh, uh, thicknesses of, uh, of coatings which are within tens of micrometer. Uh, one can also characterize the uniformity voids uh, uh, of uh, these kinds of uh, uh, coatings, uh, and uh, apparently there is no other technology uh, that um, has been able to offer the same per, uh, performance. And uh, I want to remind that this kind of application, auto industry is an application that even bulky lasers uh, can be used uh, for quality control, uh, and uh, also the cost of the system is not that important because you need one or two of them in the production line um, to scan products very quickly. Great, excellent. Uh, so the next question here is, what is the typical operating temperature of the plasmonic photoconductive terror sources that are presented in this talk? Uh, very good question. In fact, uh, all of these uh, devices uh, that I showed operate at room temperature, and uh, a lot of um, uh, even the optical uh, sources that uh, we use here uh, are all room temperature optical sources. Uh, so this is a great advantage uh, compared to quantum cascade lasers, for example. Okay. Uh, we have a question about uh, detection of tumors, I guess, for, for uh, medical uh, examinations. Uh, is there uh, great promise or is, is there, is there uh, promise for these being better able to detect tumors uh, in various uh, cases? Is there some additional comments that you can make on that? 
Uh, right. Uh, so um, there are limitations. Uh, you cannot do full body scan like the way MRI does. Uh, however, uh, you can uh, within the regime you can scan. You can uh, get very high contrast in the image. Um, I, I have to remind that sometimes uh, people are discouraged by the penetration depth of terahertz in the tissue, uh, and to them that limits the application. However, I want to remind uh, that penetration depth of terahertz waves to tissue is uh, on a ballpark somewhere about three times higher than the penetration depth of the optical waves. Uh, so uh, another important factor is uh, the water content of the tissue because penetration depth is really limited by water absorption where in the optical domain it is limited by scattering from tissue for which terahertz does very well. Uh, so if you're dealing with tissues uh, that have lower water content, you, have, uh, uh, you can easily get a deeper penetration depth. Uh, for example, for breast cancer imaging, uh, where you're dealing with more fat tissue, you have a chance to see deeper in the tissue. Or for lung tissue, you have a chance to see deeper. One uh, basic limitation in the technology so far was that uh, the systems were so bulky that all of these applications uh, for on the medical domain have been limited for uh, scanning out of the body because we couldn't uh, uh, basically see deep in the tissue and the sensors were uh, really bulky. One of the directions that my group is working on is uh, using our miniaturized uh, terahertz sources and detectors empowered by fiber lasers and embedding them in uh, endoscopy and bronchoscopy probes to do uh, imaging and sensing inside the body for GI tract and respiratory tract. So there are a lot of new opportunities uh, that are enabled by these miniaturized systems. That's great. So, so you, you're talking about uh, miniature, miniaturization. There's actually a question here about uh, about the power levels as well. So, are you, you've shown Fantastic increases in, in the amount of power that can be uh, emitted. Are, is there still a ways to go, or is, are, are we now at the, the point where uh, it's useful for many of the applications? And could you make some general comments about across the different types of, uh, of industries or applications, whether it's for industrial uses or communication uses or medicine? Are, are there regimes of operation that are still not reachable yet in terms of power? Uh, for any of these applications. Right. Uh, very good questions. Um, please remind me if I forget the second question I first answered, the first one, which is, um, is there more way to go um, uh, with these devices? So I believe there is a long way to go. There are so many opportunities uh, so uh, to enhance performance of these devices. Uh, so first of all, uh, the plasmonic uh, terahertz sources and detectors I talked about have still a lot of room to improve their efficiency. Uh, and uh, uh, as I said, uh, the whole efficiency concept is related to how well you confine light uh, next in very close proximity to your antenna input port to enhance uh, the conversion of uh, light to carriers and uh, transporting them to the antennas for radiation. So use of um, uh, more uh, innovative 3D plasmonic structures in a way that you are not dominated by plasmonic losses um, and you can do power handling at the same time at high powers and high intensities is a way that we can extend the efficiency and power of these devices further. Uh, the other uh, direction uh, that uh, would be very important, and we're working on it as well, is co-integration uh, of uh, uh, plasmonic terahertz sources with the optical sources on the same die, uh, or combining it with fiber lasers that might be a little bit bulky, but uh, since they bring the radiation through a fiber, uh, they are easily compatible uh, with um, endoscopy and bronchoscopy probes, for example, for the medical application I mentioned. Uh, 
so regarding uh, your question about uh, appli applications, are there regimes that um, are not uh, yet reachable? Uh, yes, there are uh, a lot of uh, applications that uh, we cannot even envision right now because we don't have the right tools uh, in terms of uh, remote sensing, um, having a capability uh, to basically uh, steer the beam uh, in a high speed over a broadband width uh, and uh, also provide high powers for extending the regime at which we can do imaging and sensing. Uh, it, it still needs to be done. Uh, also, one important thing to remember for applications, uh, which is specific to terahertz frequency range, it might not be the case in other technologies, is that uh, there is no winner technology for all, all applications. Depending on what application you're targeting, the practical setting that you're wishing for, there are always different solutions available. Uh, for example, the photoconductive, plasmonic photoconductive uh, technique I mentioned, uh, although uh, they have a much uh, less roll-off in, uh, in power as a function of frequency, but ultimately uh, their output power is limited by parasitics of the device. So um, I personally don't believe they are very suitable for frequencies beyond 10 terahertz, and that's a regime that quantum cascade lasers uh, can reach much higher temperature operation and nonlinear sources also become more efficient. Or on the lower frequency part, if one wants to operate below uh, half a terahertz or 0.3 terahertz, for example, for communication applications, then electronic sources have a lot of promise uh, because their efficiencies uh, are reasonable, powers are reasonable, and most importantly, they're compact, uh, they can be integrated on the same chip with other signal processing and uh, other electronics. Um, so for those applications, I believe they will be winner technologies. So that's approximately half a terahertz to about 10 terahertz, you said. Is, do you, uh, do you... I don't want to really give a hard limit uh, for a technology, but I would say on the lower frequency side, electronics is still winner. On the higher frequency side, nonlinear optical and quantum cascade lasers are uh, winners. And in between uh, the plasmonic sources, um, I do uh, a lot of uh, comparison with the colleagues who use uh, other techniques. And uh, the boundary that you're asking for is something that changes a lot whenever a new technology comes, a new material is used. Uh, so what I really want to convey here is that these technologies are complementary, and one has to really look at a specific application to identify the best set of tools to use. Great. Well said. Well said. Okay. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm afraid we are uh, at, about out of time. Uh, there are still a, a few questions here in the queue, and so if your question wasn't answered, uh, the pre presenter will follow up on those unanswered questions offline. As we said earlier, this session will be archived on the Society website at mtt.org, so please be on the lookout for that. All registrants will get an email reminder with a website address when it's available. For attendees that would like to receive the PDH credits, please follow the link that's in the webcast view and use the code that's provided on the last slide of this presentation, the slide that is being shown right now. And the, co the, the, the code is provided right there. Once again, I'd like to thank Dr. Jarahi for an excellent presentation on a really interesting topic. Our thanks also go to National Instruments, who is the sponsor for this webinar. And special thanks to our audience for joining us today. We hope you found today's event valuable and that you'll return for future IEEE Microwave Theory and Technique Society webcasts. Thank you and have a great day.